Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless colossians 2 8 beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men according to the basic principles of the world and not according to christ good morning it is such a delight to be here with you this morning. I want to thank Kathy and Tom and your Reproductive Justice uh, Working Group or Committee that invited me to join you. A couple of years ago, I was in Texas having dinner with some friends of my parents who I hadn't seen since I was a child. They have two boys about my age who were there at the dinner and I was chatting at one end of the, one end of the table with one of them about my then new book, Trust Women, that had brought me to town. And their mother, a gracious southern church-going woman in her late 70s, was sitting at the other end of the table and she must have overheard the two of us talking because she turned to her other son whispering in a stricken tone, they're talking about abortion, make them stop. When we asked Christians where they had learned that abortion was sin, many of them weren't sure, but often they did not remember ever hearing about it in church. Is abortion murder? The Bible is clear. Murder is wrong, as stated in Exodus 20:13. You shall not murder. Murder is defined is the unlawful, premeditated killing of one human being by another. Killing is done by the judgment of one human being against another for personal reasons. The Bible condemns murder repeatedly as a characteristic of a wicked society and places a person in danger of the judgment, as we read in Matthew 5.21. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. So is a fetus a human? Or is it something else? Biologically speaking, human life begins at conception. No more genetic material needs to be added when the mother's egg and the father's sperm come together. They combine and create a new string of DNA that is personalized and totally unique. DNA is coded in information, the blueprint for the new human's growth and development. When a mother has an abortion, she is destroying a unique life. The Bible clearly teaches the conception is the beginning of human life as we read in Judges 16, 17, that he told her all his heart and said to her, no razor has ever come upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I am shaven, then my strength will leave me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. Samson refers to his unborn self as having already been what God planned him to be, a Nazarite. Again, the psalmist King David wrote that he was wonderfully made by God in his mother's womb as we read in Psalm 139, 13 through 16. For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance, being yet unformed, and in your book they all were written. The days fashioned for me, when as yet, there were none of them. God says that he knew the prophet Jeremiah before he was in his mother's womb. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. King Solomon, inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, wrote about the child in a mother's womb. As you do not know what is the way of the wind or how the bones grow in the womb of her who is with child, so you do not know the works of God who makes everything. A baby in the womb has feelings, as we read in Luke 1.44. For indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. The baby, who would be known as John the Baptist, experienced the emotion of joy when Mary, being pregnant with the incarnate Jesus, entered Elizabeth's home. God's word has a lot to say about killing the innocent. Proverbs 24.11 and 12. Rescue those who are being taken away to death. 
Hold back those who are stumbling to the slaughter. If you say, Behold, we did not know this. Does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he who keeps watch over your soul know it? And will he not repay man according to his work? Proverbs 6, 16-19 These six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift and running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among brethren. The Bible teaches that at conception, an unborn child is a human being that God is forming. It doesn't really matter what humans mandate is socially or politically acceptable. God's law takes precedence, as we read in Acts 5.29. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. A mother who decides to abort her child is making a decision to end another person's life, and that is, and always has been, the definition of murder. There is good news for anyone who has had an abortion, and that is, that God offers forgiveness to anyone who confesses their sins, as we read in 1 John 1.9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is the abortion imaginary at work sowing seeds of stigma, shame, sin, and doubt. In the midst of this pervasive abortion imaginary, it's not enough to return the legal right of abortion to pregnant people, pregnant people, pregnant people. Just to be clear, the Bible doesn't say anything about abortion. Nothing. And I refuse to cede the sacredness of Scripture or its interpretation to those who would wield it as a weapon. For this very reason, I chose to highlight Psalm 139 this morning because it is one of the anthems of the abortion imaginary. Some of you may already know that Psalm 139 is not only the anthem of the anti-choice movement, but also an anthem for the LGBTQIA community. Irony. <laughs> the celebration of being fearfully and wonderfully made is also an affirmation and celebration of queerness. There are many people within the church who are teaching that homosexuality is not a sin, when scripture clearly says it is. This is another sign Jesus gave to look for prior to his second coming, as we read in Matthew 24:11. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. Homosexuality is strongly condemned in the Bible. Ezekiel 16.49-50 Look, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughter had pride, fullness of food, and abundance of idleness. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. And they were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore I took them away as I saw fit. What was this prideful abomination committed before God? The answer is found in the book of Leviticus. Leviticus 18.22 You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. Leviticus 20.13 If a man lies with a male as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. God gives mankind a dire warning for the acts of homosexuality in 2 Peter 2.6 And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. God also offers forgiveness to those who are living a life of homosexuality as we read in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. As a child of God, I can certainly appreciate the lyrical beauty of this text as well as the descriptions in Jeremiah and Job of their certain knowledge that God was with them in the womb. I too feel that I am known by God in these ways. What does it mean to be a child of God? 1 John 3.10 explains what it means to be a child of God. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. 
The life of a child of God will be completely different from the life of the unsaved. A child of God has a desire to live in a way that pleases the Heavenly Father, as we read in 1 Corinthians 10.31. Therefore, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Many people wrongly believe that everyone is a child of God. The Bible teaches us this is not true. We can only become His children when we believe in the name of Jesus Christ, as we read in John 1.12. But as many as received Him, to them He gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in His name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. 2 Corinthians 5.17 describes what happens when we are born again into the family of God through faith in Jesus. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Jesus taught that becoming children of God means we must experience a new birth, as we read in John 3.3. 3. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. A child of God is no longer a child of the devil, and God sets about transforming his children through the power of the Holy Spirit, as we read in Romans 8, 13, and 14. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. If we do not begin to look like our Heavenly Father in word, desire, and action, we are most likely not really His, as we read in 1 John 2, 3, and 4. Now by this we know that we know Him, if we keep His commandments. He who says, I know Him, and does not keep His commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in Him. Human beings were created to live as children of God. Sin marred that purpose and broke that bond with Him. Christ restores us to that original relationship. As a woman who has born two children, I can affirm that I felt something sacred happening in my gestating body during those pregnancies. I can also attest that I felt God's presence with me as I made the decision to end two pregnancies. And I felt no guilt, no shame, no sin. As complicated, thoughtful, morally capable people, we are able to hold both of these realities in tension. That the gestation and birth of a child is a wondrous event to be celebrated, and that not all pregnancies will or need to culminate in a birth. This is theologically consistent with the belief that prenates are not yet human beings and with the theological belief that women are moral agents capable of making careful, thoughtful, responsible decisions about whether to continue a pregnancy. As a sign of his coming and the end of the age, Jesus said there would be a falling away from the Christian faith, and false teachers would rise up, as we read in Matthew 24, 10 and 11. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another, and many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. The Bible tells us these false prophets will twist God's word, as we read in 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16. And consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, as written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction as they do also the rest of the scriptures. The Bible goes on to tell us that these false teachers are Satan's servants, as we read in 2 Corinthians 11, 14, and 15. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. The last days church will not follow the truth in the Bible. They will find false teachers to tell them their sin is okay. And not just that it is okay, but it is biblical, as we read in 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires, and will turn away their ears from the truth, and will turn aside to myths. 
This is what last days Christianity looks like. It is a Christianity that says there are many paths to heaven. When the Bible clearly says Jesus Christ is the only way, it is a Christianity that approves of homosexuality, fornication. If you are having sex and you are not married, it's not called dating, it's called fornication. And abortion, even though God says these things are sin, it is a Christianity that in its church services look just like the world. Jesus goes on to tell us the last day's church will be such a worldly, Christ-rejecting church that he has been thrown out, as we read in Revelation 3:14 through 22. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things, says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth, because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold, refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him, and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. In these verses of Scripture, Jesus is talking about the last day's lukewarm church. A church that has one foot in the world and one foot in the church. This church is so disgustingly lukewarm that Jesus vomits it out of his mouth. Jesus counsels the last day's church to buy from him gold, which is purity, white garments, which is righteousness, and I salve, which is truth. These three things can only come from the purity, righteousness, and truth that Jesus offers through salvation in him. Jesus is now standing outside the door of the last day's Laodicean church offering salvation to anyone who will listen. This is the grace and mercy of God. He has been kicked out of his own church and yet still knocks and offers salvation to anyone who hears his voice and opens the door. I implore you today, if you are not saved or are a lukewarm Christian, to take up Jesus' offer of salvation that can only be received through him and only him. John 14.6 Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive in faith the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You 
you may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.